Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to be talking about marriage and healthy relationships, as I'm joined by former critical care nurse, uh, attorney, and author, Nancy Purpall. Nancy has used conflict resolution in all her lines of work, come to the best resolution and get her way. She also served on the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. So we're going to be talking to her about everything that she's up to and marriage and healthy relationships. Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. And I just want to clarify one thing. I was chair for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania's Domestic Relations Rules Committee. I did not serve on the Supreme Court, which means I would have been a justice. That would have been nice, (laughs) but it wasn't my role. In any event, yes, I did domestic relations for over 32 years And I'm happy to be here today to join you to educate your audience. Gotcha. So can you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yes. I actually began my career as a critical care nurse. And I worked in the intensive care unit and the emergency room because they require two different sets of skills, both of which I had. And I wrote a textbook, Advanced Concepts in Clinical Nursing, with some people from the University of Pennsylvania. And I tried to incorporate some of the protocols that we had in that textbook that we were, that were being adopted uh, throughout the United States in nursing programs. And regardless of how I tried, the administration really didn't listen. So the hospital had recently hired person. It was a woman who had been a nurse and became an attorney as the hospitals, basically, you know, a safety officer, you know, to make sure there was no malpractice in procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So I approached her one day in the cafeteria and I said, you know, no one is really listening to me. I have all of these credentials. What, what is your recommendation? And she looked at me and she said, go to law school. I said, oh, really? She said, lawyers have power. They'll listen to you. (laughs) So I went to law school. (laughs) In any event, it's a long story, but I ended up doing domestic relations. I started out doing defense malpractice, but the firm lost the contract to represent the physicians in their lawsuits. And they had given me 75 files the first day I was on the job because I was a, quote, woman. And this is woman's work. And so I tried very hard to do a good job with domestic as I was doing defense malpractice. When they lost the contract, I had something to fall back on. And I became, I started my own firm and I became a very successful divorce lawyer. Okay. Well, tell us about your role as the chair on the Supreme Court. Let us know what what you did. What I did there was What we were responsible for were the rules associated with support, alimony, custody, equitable distribution, paternity, the gamut of family law. And in promulgating those rules, which had to be adopted by the Supreme Court, and they usually were, they they changed the way the court system actually approached family law. Um, We were trying very hard to avoid the situation where a litigant had to go to support court one day, custody divorce, custody court another day, equitable distribution court another day, you know, mediation. I mean, it was, you know, people can't keep taking off work to deal with their divorce without it having a negative impact on their employment. And we were very sensitive to that when I was chair and we were trying to get a family court more or less installed. And Pennsylvania has been very successful at trying to meld those those issues 
and trying to avoid that problem. Now, most states are also trying to follow that rule. Some states are better than other states. But as you know, because of the 14th Amendment, every state makes its own rules associated with divorce, custody, support, paternity, you know, the gamut of family law issues. Well, I've noticed, and you even talk about it in your bio, that divorces in over 50 couples have doubled and over 60 couples have tripled. Why do you think that is? Um, there's a very, there's a very illogical reason for that. People in their 50s today have been married probably 20, 25, 30 years maybe. And when they got married, there was a real stigma associated with divorce. There's no longer a stigma associated with divorce. And rather than being an unhappy marriage, when you're 50 years old, you're thinking about your your mortality. You know, most people are going to live into their 70s, you know, hopefully 80s. And, you know, people just aren't willing to put up with an unhappy marriage and a situation that is causing their, you know, is a negative impact on their health. Because we all know that stress is the biggest predictor for illness, especially when you're over 50, whether it be heart related, thyroid related, cancer, you name it, uh, stroke. Stress is a horrible, horrible, has a horrible impact on the human body. And people who are in that situation just aren't willing to put up with it anymore. There's no stigma attached to it. You know, regrettably, you know, the communities, the religious communities that by and large held together certain populations are falling by the wayside. Few and few, fewer and fewer people are going actually to, you know, a religious services re- religiously, far, <laughs> pardon the pun, as they used to. So there's no stigma. And the same for people over 60. I mean, the, for people over 60, it's tripled. Um, You know, that, you know, I'm now, I recently retired, but during the last five years of my practice, I had more people in their late 60s, 70s, and I had an 82 year old man who finally had had enough and left. So, I mean, it's, you know, there's no stigma associated with it. Um, I think it's a 50 50, you know, and as many women leave at that age as, as men. Uh, men are more motivated, it seems, at least my anecdotal experience is due to sex. They want to continue. I mean, is it okay to talk about sex on your program? I didn't ask you. I was oh, recently it's fine. It's fine. and they didn't want to talk about sex. And I said, well, you know, sex is a part of marriage in any event. You know, if the testosterone is still going, if they're taking supplements, if they if they're trying to make, you know, take care of themselves, you know. They still want to have sex. And many women after menopause, they're not interested. And that is the, you know, that's the recipe for a disaster in a marriage. I mean, sex is the building block of a marriage. In the book that I'm writing and is going to be published in 2023, it's called The Malnourished Marriage, Five Essential Emotional Nutrients for Happy Relationship, a Healthy Relationship. I compare sex to a protein. Protein we all know is the building block of the body. The first thing you want to give your infant is what? It's protein, right? Because that is the building block for the baby. It's still, it is the building block of a relationship. Sex and intimacy is what every single successful marriage needs to be healthy. And unfortunately, that wanes. You know, it wanes. And there's a chemical reason for why it wanes. And I think people are becoming more and more aware of that and tolerant of that to a certain extent. But there's still this desire, this ache in your gut that you just don't want to live your life as if you're living with a roommate. You want to have some passion. You want adventure. You still want risk. I mean, a big motivation when you first meet somebody is a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is a stimulant. It activates the same area of the brain that cocaine activates. 
dopamine is what you why you become obsessed with this person why you constantly think about them why you talk for hours on the phone that's all motivated by dopamine and dopamine is produced when you have novelty so when you feel as if your marriage is fizzling and you feel as and you can sense that your partner your spouse or partner is becoming disengaged. You know they're unhappy. Try some novelty. Try, you know, cooking a new recipe with them, trying to go to a new restaurant, trying to go to a different area of the city. Try asking them, you know, hey, do you have any fantasies about what you'd like to do? We're sort of in a rut. Let's get it going here. I mean, there are so many things people can do to help their marriage become healthy once it starts to become anemic, you know, on the lack of hormones that it takes to keep a relationship going. So let's talk about COVID and domestic violence and, and how that affected divorce filings. Uh, what, what did you see when COVID hit as far as domestic violence and divorce filings? Um, there was a 31% increase in domestic violence directly associated with COVID. And there was a survey that was done by family court lawyer, uh, judges and also the lawyers who were representing the litigants in those domestic, re domestic dispute cases. And it seems that a lot of the disputes were over vaccinations, whether you should, you know, whether you're going to get vaccinated, your partner's going to get vaccinated, whether the kids should get vaccinated, whether the kids should go to school or be virtually taught, whether the kids should be masked, whether you they're going to be masked, and also a tremendous problem with the political divide in this country, you know, with disparity of opinions about abortion, about politics. The country is very divisive and not only out there in the, you know, the Etherland, it's it's in homes, it's in the families in our country. And, um, you know, sadly, for a while, about, I guess, five or six years, you know, the research was that divorce was on a decline. Now, that wasn't because people weren't pairing up. Um, they just weren't getting married. And, you know, the divorces were on the downturn. People were getting married later in life, and so they were older, they were more schooled, they had had sexual experiences, they had more of an idea, concrete idea of the spouse or the partner they wanted to align with, as opposed to years ago when most people got married, you know, 1920, you know, 21 you know, when I was growing up, if you weren't married by 21, you're an old maid. <laughs> but in any event, you know, 28 to 32 is now the average age. And there's been a drastic uptick in divorces because of COVID over the same arguments, over the same disputes, and over the fact that that much time together really brought into focus the 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 differences and the dissatisfaction that the company, the couple had with each other. Why do you feel like more millennials are signing prenuptial agreements these days? Um, the research is that millennials have had the experience of seeing the realities of divorce in their own life, in the life of their friends, perhaps in the life of the partner that they're going to you know, that they want ultimately to spend the rest of their life with. Uh, millennials also, as I said, are getting married older. So they may have established careers, and whether it's professional career, um, doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief in the corporation or what, they still may have an established profession as, you know, a plumber, an electrician, a bricklayer, a sheet metal worker, all of whom are participating in pensions and, you know, building up their own nest eggs. Uh, so they're coming to the marriage with more assets than has ever been realized in the past. And they're also coming with a lot more knowledge of the impact of divorce and the impact of a high conflict divorce. 
no one wins in a high conflict divorce. And the American Association of Matrimonial Lawyers did research and it surveyed, um, and forgive me, I don't remember how many thousands of domestic lawyers in the United States, but it surveyed a substantial number of domestic lawyers in the United States, family lawyers, and they found that there was a 51% increase in, in prenuptial agreements, and it was mostly among millennials. Now, when you're marrying for the second time, say you're married you get divorced in your 30s or 40s, and then you remarry. You absolutely have to get a prenuptial agreement to protect yourself the second time around. Or you, how many times can you divide your assets? Because the average American is going to be married two to three times by you know 2030. So, And the average American marriage now lasts seven years. Well, let's talk about, speaking of divorce, give people some tips who, who might have went through divorce on recovering from divorce. I think the biggest tip that I can give is um, for the dependent spouse. The spouse who has, you know, a good paying job, who's going to continue to have health insurance, who has a pension, albeit, you know, in most states, that pension is divided that which was acquired or accrued rather during the course of the marriage, it's going to be divided 50-50. But after they get divorced, they're going to continue to have a pension. They're going to continue to accrue assets. The dependent spouse, in most cases, is the woman, because women are still not being paid at the rate or compensated in many manner and fashion than men are So for the dependent spouse, usually the woman, the first thing she or he, if he's the dependent spouse, should do is a budget. Before you get divorced, you need to do a budget. You need to figure out if you're not going to continue to have health insurance, how much is that going to cost? If you're not going to be able to have a pension, what would you like to try to put away every month in an IRA? towards a pension, because the reality is there may not be social security, you know, in 20 years, who knows, depending upon what happens Tuesday, there may not be any next year. (laughs) But in any event, uh, the reality is, you've got to come up, how much is it going to cost you to live after this, after the divorce? And with that information, you are armed to, to really go in and try to negotiate an intelligent settlement. So the planning isn't really, in my opinion, after the divorce. The planning is all before the divorce. After The reality is you're not going to live. Your lifestyle is going to change unless you are the person making a six-figure income. Your lifestyle is going to change after a divorce. You cannot live singly as you did as a couple. And if there are children involved, that even complicates things more. If there are children involved, you really have to put pen to paper and figure out in terms of child support what you are really going to need. If you have a special needs child and, and some of those wraparound services are not covered, I don't know a state in our country or the territories that doesn't take that into consideration. But if you don't really do your homework and bring it before the court, you're going to be out of luck. So a lot of it is preparation before you get divorced. You have to know what your assets are, know what your liabilities are, know who accumulated the liabilities. You know, what is the credit card debt? Uh, did either of you come to the marriage with, with a school debt? If you did, did you both contribute to paying that? And in some states, the other spouse may give some sort of credit for their contribution paying off your school debt. So all of these things have got to be looked at before you get divorced. Talk about the three F's of intimacy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Sex and intimacy, there are three F's. One is the feelings. And this is research that's been done, you know, and it's, it's, been in psychology today. It's, you know, you can Google some, some of it on, you know, the internet. And 
before you get married, it's always best. And if you feel as if, you know, you're going through a bump in the road here in your marriage, you should talk to your spouse or your partner about what are your feelings? That's the first F. What are your feelings about sex? Are you, is it an issue because you just thought it would happen spontaneously, you know, without any sort of romance, without any planning, without any purpose, you know, of trying to woo the other person, you know, when you're dating and when you're in that dopamine state of mind, you know, every, you know, you're, you're both basically drunk on dopamine. So, and dopamine is mother nature's way of what, of telling you to have sex with that person so that you could propagate so that, you know, that the, the species keeps going on. You know, that's what we're designed for. We're designed to keep the species going. We're divine for survival. We've all know that. And that's what the dopamine does. After you get married, the dopamine dissipates. Dopamine only lasts for 18 to 24 months, and then it goes away naturally. The brain recalibrates and the dopamine goes away. So to get the dopamine, as I already said earlier, novelty. Novelty will trigger the dopamine and make the person that you're with more attractive. You're more sexually interested in them. So doing novel things is really what you need to do. But you're not going to get anywhere unless you talk about it. So the thing is, feelings, you've got to talk about the feelings. Communication is the key thing in every marriage. And it's particularly key when your marriage is being stressed. So the second F is uh, frequency. You need to talk with your intended. Like how often do you anticipate having sex? I mean, some people are highly, highly sexual and want to have it, you know, every night, every, you know, a couple of times a week, you know, and you may not be paired with somebody who feels the same way. Talking about your expectation before you get married will avoid a lot of problems after you get married. If you're married and you're still, as I said, you're feeling that bump in the road, you need to be honest with your spouse and you need to say, you know, I really desire you. I love you. I find you attractive. What can we do to make you more interested in having sex on a more frequent basis? The next one is fantasy. It's absolutely crucial to talk to your partner or spouse about fantasy. What are your fantasies? What would you like to do? And again, this goes back to dopamine. Even talking about it stimulates dopamine. And dopamine is really the mating chemical in your brain. And, you know, as a nurse, I learned about this, you know, 50 years ago. But, you know, it's now coming to the fore in, in articles, in YouTube presentations, that, that people are being instructed about the fact that dopamine can really stimulate your relationship, the novelty of doing something, the novelty of even talking about fantasy will help, will help the relationship. So those are the few, those are the three F's, feelings, frequency, and fantasy. So for, for couples who are looking to resolve their issues without it being an all out war, Give, give some tips on them being able to do that. Well, first of all, um, the whole issue of, you know, scorch the earth divorces has been dead for a decade, two decades. For, for most, the courts don't want to hear it. You know, they're not going to tolerate that. Those days are over. That whole myth evolved when their fault was an issue in divorce and you had to prove one or the other spouse was the bad egg was the horrible person. You know, one person was the injured spouse and nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares who the injured spouse is. You know, basically the, you know, everybody feels as if it takes two and maybe one person is worse than the other. Now, if there's domestic violence, I mean, let me just say, there's a big caveat in what I'm saying here. If there is domestic violence or emotional abuse, get out and, you know, I mean, that's a whole different, animal in terms of 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 getting divorced and you can't really 
uh, talk to your partner or spouse if there's domestic violence or abuse in it. If there's not domestic violence or abuse, I think most people are smart enough to realize that <laughs> fighting over the lava lamp, you know, first of all, I don't know many lawyers who will do that anymore. No one is going to win. You're going to squander your money by litigating. You ought to try to go to a mediator and come with come with your homework done. Come prepared with a sheet of all of your assets and don't be cute. Don't not tell the other spouse what is really going on. Show their credit card debts. You know, if you made some charges for your girlfriend, be honest about it. The marriage is over anyway. You know, if you lie about it, it's much worse. It is much worse if you lie about it. I mean, I had a case once where this man was spending $1,500 a lap dance in New York City. And, you know, I, I won't go into the excuse he gave, but, you know, my client said I was representing the wife in that case. She said, if he had just told me the truth, I mean, seriously, we would have worked out a way to give me credit for that expense. I mean, you know, I mean, he spent like $12,000, you know, when he was on a business trip in New York on lap dances. So, I mean, she was going to get compensated for that. But I mean, he lied and he came up with all these receipts, which were bogus. And it just cost them both monies and attorney's fees. I mean, those days are over. I mean, it's truly over. First of all, the courts don't want to hear it. Most lawyers don't want to hear it. And certainly the litigants, I mean, the litigants really should not squander their money, a lot of litigation. When I first started practicing domestic relations in Pennsylvania, the statute relevant to no-fault divorce and equitable distribution had just been passed. So there really was no case law associated with our pensions, really marital property. Um, what about certain debts? What about you know, premarital property that's commingled with marital property. There were all kinds of of issues that were cases of what was called first impression that we brought to the appellate courts. And then a judge would rule on it in an appellate court. It would become precedent. And then that became the law of the state. And most states that has happened. So there's a law for almost almost every single issue you could have has been adjudicated and your lawyer can do the research and find out what your particular concern is. Most mediators are very savvy with respect to domestic relations law. And if they're not, they will, you know, I think most of them will will suggest that you consult your attorney, certainly before coming to any agreement, but don't waste your money litigating. Do not waste your money litigating. Unless, of course, again, you have some sort of special needs child, then you can't come to an agreement about a custody schedule. You know, there is some, you know, uh, peculiar issue in your case that can't get resolved by prior law or by the way the attorney will tell you the judge normally decides. That's different. But by and large, 90% of the cases, 95% of the cases can be resolved through mediation and settlement. Let's talk about affairs. Why do people have affairs and, and give some tips on cu- couples who might be dealing with an affair? Um, well, that's a very nuanced <laughs> question. And um, there are many, many theories about affairs. Um, I think the predominant theory right now among psychologists is that there are two types of affairs. There are emotional affairs that have a very detrimental effect on a marriage. And that is extremely hard for a couple to repair. The emotional affair is where one spouse has really been more emotionally involved, concerned, and supportive of the person outside of the marriage than the partner or spouse to whom you are married. Um, That can be a combination of an emotional affair plus a physical affair. And when it's an emotional and physical affair, you know, in 32, I guess I was practicing almost 34 years, 
when it's been an emotional and physical affair, people may try to repair it, but they eventually come back, you know, either, you know, the next year or two years or three years or five years later. I haven't seen any successfully um, repair and be able to resolve the issue of hurt, abandonment, and betrayal that happens in an emotional and physical affair. The reasons for that are one spouse who's having the affair feels either disrespected, not appreciated, as if they're not getting the benefit of the bargain of what they thought they were going to get in the marriage, unrealistic expectations. There's a, a myriad of reasons why somebody would stray in a relationship. Many times it's because a child or children have added such an extraordinary burden to the marriage that the couple is not taking enough time for themselves and putting themselves first and really doing the things that we've already discussed. And that is, you know, looking for, you know, the excitement, you know, looking for, you know, that dopamine rush. And when all you're you're going on is oxytocin, which is the binding, you know, the bonding chemical, that doesn't really go very far. It's the excitement. It's the it's the uh, it's the longing for the other person that you can, you know, you can recalibrate and retread throughout your marriage. And long term marriages really have a way of working that out. Um, there's now a lot of financial infidelity, which is um, secreting money from the other spouse, secreting money from the other spouse, you know, taking money out of an account, changing a beneficiary and a life insurance policy. I mean, lending money to a family member without the consent or knowledge of the other spouse or partner incurring credit card debt, for example, financial infidelity is my argument to the court, which they bought, you know, in that situation where this guy's spending (laughs) $1,500 on a lap dance in New York, that was a financial infidelity because he was, he had gotten a bonus and that's where the bonus went. So that was financial infidelity and they, we will be compensated for that. So, you know, pornography is more or less emotional infidelity. So there are like all kinds of categories of infidelity now. It's not the standard, you know, husband has an affair, wife has an affair, and that's an infidelity. There's a whole range of different things that you can categorize as an infidelity. Tell us about your books and any current and upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Thank you, Curtis. I'm glad that you're allowing me to plug my book. (laughs) My debut novel is Around Which All Things Bend. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. It is about relationships, and it actually, in story form, touches on many of the things that we've been discussing this afternoon. Um, The title, Around Which All Things Bend, is really love, and love is the thing around, love is the thing that we will bend ourselves into pretzels to get and or to give until we can't bend anymore. And I think, you know, the yoga, uh, the yoga term is bend so you don't break. And that's really where I got the idea. You can bend and bend and bend to keep your love going. But at some point, if you're not feeling like we just talked about a few minutes ago, Curtis, if you're not feeling like you're getting anything back on the other side, you break. You detach. In a marriage, detaching is breaking. And so that's what that debut novel is about. The book that's coming out in 2023, I'd love to come back and talk in more detail about it. That book is really my passion to try to... I worked for over 32 years. Actually, I keep thinking it's 34. I just don't want to age myself any more than I am. But in any event, you know, I talk about the malnourished marriage and I... I use the metaphor of food because everybody, you know, will come together for food. And in this book, I describe how you can talk to your partner in a way that they don't feel attacked. In other words, uh, I use water is communication 
and communication is the absolute key to a marriage. You can't live more than three days without water, and you can't live, a relationship cannot survive without water. It just cannot survive, I mean, without communication. And then I talk about protein. We already mentioned that earlier. That has to do with sex and intimacy. That's the binding block of a, a marriage and a relationship. Carbohydrate is humor, and I discuss that. And compromise and patience are healthy fats. And trust is the multivitamin supplement. So I go through that, and I basically, in the book, explain to people how to talk to the person you're with as if you love them and to let them know that you love them and to try to diffuse the constant regurgitation of the arguments that come up over and over and over again. And I actually, in the book, explain, you know, the theory of why that happens. So there's a lot of psychology. There's a lot of practical advice in that book. But there's also a lot of psychology and practical advice in the novel. And, uh, you know, I highly recommend the novel, not because I wrote it, but because it's getting really good reviews on Amazon. And almost every single one of those reviews has has mentioned that there's a lot of psychology, there's a lot of practical tips, and there's a lot of relationship advice in that novel that you come away with, but it doesn't hit you in the face. It's in a story. You follow this protagonist through the story, and you can almost internalize it through what happens to the protagonist in this book. Oh, when I have a website, Nancy Perpal, spelled P E R P A L L dot com. And I have a lot of blogs on there that talk about everything we've been discussing this afternoon. And I highly recommend that. If you don't want to buy the book, please do yourself a favor and look at some of these blogs that may help you. I talk about, you know, insanity is inherited. You get it from your kids. I mean, that means, you know, when you have kids, you know, you're going to be tested and your relationship will be tested. I deal with the intimacy, you know, sexual issues after you've had a baby. There's a lot of new research about how men actually have postpartum depression. It's being recognized and they're doing blood studies on uh, young fathers who feel detached. And I talk about, you know, there's a blog about that. So I highly recommend those blogs. They are free and there are resources in there. So that's nancyperpal.com spelled P-E-R-P-A-L-L. -L. Well, that was going to be my next question. So <laughs> give us some final thoughts, maybe something that I failed to touch on that you would like to talk about or just any final thoughts you have for the listeners. Well, actually, you've really covered the gamut. I think the only final thought that I would have is that if you're thinking about getting married and you really don't want to execute a prenuptial agreement, you still really should discuss um, the financial goals that you have with your partner. Don't let that be a surprise. What are your spending What's your philosophy about spending? Do you think we're going to need an emergency fund? You know, what do you, you know, what is your goal? Do you think we're going to, are you thinking we're going to be able to buy a house? When do you think? Are you a saver? Are you a spender? That has to be discussed before you get married. The same thing about whole three Fs, sex. I mean, there are hard questions you should ask if you're thinking about getting married. And if you are married and you're stuck in a rut, do something novel. Do yourself a favor. You probably don't need a divorce. You need a diversion. Get yourself a diversion. Do something exciting. Think about what your fantasies are. Sit down with your partner or spouse and say, hey, you know, I think we're in a rut. What's your fantasy about how to get out of that rut? You know, what do you think we should do? And hopefully they'll ask, well, what do you think we should do? And maybe hopefully you've rethought it and give them your answer. But it doesn't have to be expensive. I know inflation is eating everybody's bank account. Yeah, trust me, I know all about that. But, um, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. You can, you can do simple things. Go to the park. Go to another part of the city. I mean, you know, go to a new restaurant. It doesn't have to be a fancy restaurant. It can be a dive. But 
you know, it can just be different and new and read a different book. I mean, just something to get yourself out of that ho-hum. Listen, most of us, and myself included, I mean, you go to work, you get up in the morning, you eat basically the same kind of breakfast one way or another, either on the way to work or right before you leave the house, you go to work, you work, 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 you get out of work, you go home, or you do whatever you do, and then eventually you get home, you go to bed, you get up the next day, and you're working, working, working again. You know, we all fall into this rut. It's human. I mean, that's the society we live in now. We're not hunter-gatherers. You know, men aren't going out on the plains looking for saber tigers to kill and bring back. Women are in Sydney nesting at the fire. I mean, we're in a very high pressure Western society. Everything is fast, 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 fast. So you have to take a break with your spouse or partner. You have to take time for each other. That is paramount because I'm telling you something. If your relationship falls apart, you are going to be really in a very stressful state because you're going to feel abandoned. You're going to feel a loss of love. You're going to feel longing. You're going to feel rejected. And it's called post breakup ache. And there's no time for that. But once again, there's a chemical reason for that. And there's a physiological reason. And you physically feel in your body the effects of feeling abandoned, feeling dumped. And I really would love for people not to have to go through that. I've seen what it has done to people. And I've been divorced myself. Hey, listen, I got dumped for somebody 20 years younger when I was in the hospital having a hip replacement. I know how it feels. I mean, I had the benefit of making enough money and being the breadwinner that I, you know, easily survived the divorce. But I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. And I don't want that to happen to people, anyone in your audience, Curtis. Me neither. So to prevent that, go to nancypapal.com. Check out her blogs, her articles, her books. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And if you enjoyed this episode or you enjoyed the show, make sure to tell a friend. Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much, Curtis. I really appreciate the invite. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.